the deal with SEO on Wix. Okay. Bear with me. It's been a long time since I've done this. It's been two years since I've done a YouTube Live, um, which is exciting. And also, uh, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some technical errors. But uh, can everyone hear me? Let's start there. Can you hear my voice? This is the universal mime for voice. <laughs> yes, no? All good, great. Um, well, welcome. I'm gonna give it a you know a few minutes for folks to pop in here. Um, very lucky to have my good uh, buddy Jeff here helping out moderating. Um, this is I was saying to him before. This is like having Gordon Ramsay as your sous chef, you know. <laughs> so uh, today is a quick. Speaking of which, today is a quick little lesson, an amuse bouche of lessons, tiny little lesson here. But I think one that's kind of fun and uh, and useful. Um, everyone can hear that guitar, I'm assuming. Um, and we're going to talk about a chord shape that I think is really useful and sounds great. And it can be used for rhythm playing. It can be used as a template for building solos off of. And the other thing I really like about this chord shape is that um, it can be used in a lot of different styles. And I think it's largely associated with classic country or Western swing or with um, lap steel guitar. But I'll show you uh, in today's lesson that there's a lot of different applications for it. And it's all about context and how you arrange this thing. You know, all the little details, how you're playing it, what's your guitar tone, um, you know, what rhythms are you using, and then the context of the track that you're playing over. So the chord that I'm talking about here is a major sixth chord. And major sixth chord, just like a major chord, it is a major chord, um, but we're going to be adding in the sixth note to that triad. So we're going to have root, third, fifth, and sixth. And often what happens is, is we'll replace the fifth note of a chord with the sixth. So let me show you how to make this thing, and then we'll talk about different ways that we can mess with it and have fun with it. Let's do this in A, because it's dead center of the neck, really easy to see here. So I'm gonna start with A. Let me just turn off that drive there. Um, I'm going to start with a A major chord on the top four strings. And for this whole lesson, I'm just going to stick to this. So just, you know, friendly, winnable battle here. So on the D string, I have the root. Uh, G string, I have the third. B string, I have the fifth of the chord. And then I have another root on top. So I'm going to go to that fifth on that second string. And... For this, you need to know your distances between the fifth and sixth, your scale degree numbers in a major scale. In this case, it's a whole step, so five to six, whole step. I'm just going to place the pinky down a whole step higher, and I've turned an A major chord into an A six chord. Pretty easy, right? Easy to do. Roots are on the D string and the E string, so if you want to play this A and D, you just move it up where you have a D here on the 12th fret and a D on the 10th fret, and you got a D6. You want to do it in E, move it up a whole step, you got an E6. So there's your major six chord. Really cool chord. Um, so let me show you some different ways that you could use this. Um, I'm gonna bring up a country shuffle, and um, we're gonna use this over a country shuffle. And so I'll, I'll just use it simply over the track at first, and then I'll add a quick embellishment to it that's gonna make it sound way more interesting and give us quick access to a whole other quality. Before I get to this, I wanna mention that um, on February 10th, I have a new course coming out. Um, it's called Imitating Lap Steel Foundations, and it's dealing with a lot of this stuff. 
So we're learning how to play major six chords. We're learning all the inversions of major six chords, how to connect them, how to voice lead them, how to embellish them in different ways, common melodic figures, um, all in the context of classic country. But honestly, everything you would learn in that course, you could apply to other styles, as you'll see in today's lesson. It's available for pre-order. Jeff put that link in the chat. And for pre-order, it's 55% off. So good chance to pick it up, save a little dough. All right, so we're gonna do this over Country Shuffle. Let me bring up a track here, and I'm gonna do this in D. So one, four, five, and D, I'm gonna be looking for a D6. My four chord is gonna be a G6. My five chord is gonna be an A6. And first really simple embellishment I'll do is just sliding into this. So really trying to emulate the sound of a lap steel. Really simple here. So let me bring up the track. Get that classic country sound right away that six chord because lap steel is tuned to c6 and we're making a six chord so it's immediately um kind of informing our ear uh of like the lap steel sound classic country sound all right so quick little tweak we could do to this that steel players do all the time that sounds really cool is to move this down a whole step so if i'm playing over that d and I drop this down a whole step, I get quick access to a whole new quality chord. Major six chord, this is gonna be a dominant nine chord. So over that D, that same shape a whole step down gives me a flat nine, a, oh sorry, a flat seven, a nine, a five, and a flat seven. So I went from a major six to a dominant nine. And I could connect those chromatically, a little chromatic passing chord in there. And I could do that for every one of these chords, for the four chord, for the five chord, back to the one. And I could arrange that wherever I want, right? So I could grab sets of strings, I could arpeggiate it. Up to the five chord. So now with that quick little trick, we've immediately made this sound so much cooler and we're still using the same shape. Let me bring up the track again and put it in context. You can check it out here. Okay, got a little fancy there with the volume swells. I couldn't resist. Um, but sounds pretty cool. Co classic country context, that's gonna sound great. You could use that for Western swing. It's gonna sound great. Let's look at some other styles that we could use this in. So let's try, um, we'll try this with the blues. So it's gonna be a blues and C here. So major six chord, we're good for my one chord. There it is in C. My four chord is gonna be F, so there's an F6. Five chord is gonna be G, so there's a G6. And for all these shapes, I could drop them down a whole step. Here's an F up an octave. G up an octave. G down an octave. Back to C. So let's try this out over a blues this time.
So takes on a whole different characteristic playing over a blues, right? And if we were playing a jump blues, we could use it kind of like little horn section stabs. All right, let's move on to another context. So how about rockabilly? Let's do it for rockabilly. So I'll do this in E, and how I'll arrange it this time is with Travis picking. So one chord is gonna be E, I'll do this all the way up here at the uh, 12th and 14th fret, there's my E's. My four chord is gonna be down here for A. Five chords a whole step higher always. I have a B6, so E6, A6, B6. Same shape the whole time, and I'm going to arrange this by Travis picking. Okay, sounds totally different in that context, right? Um, I didn't really walk it down too much. I did on the five chord there a little bit. And I walked it down in sets of three, uh, three strings. Going through all the inversions. Again, all those inversions are the stuff that I cover in that, uh, that new chorus and connecting those things. Um, okay, let's try one more. Because it's kind of fun. Let's do something completely different and let's do a Hawaiian track. So for this, uh, let me change up the tone a little bit here. Uh, made sure I put the pedal board in a totally uncomfortable place. Um, so just add a little bit more reverb, but for this one, I'm going to be in the key of D and Hawaiian changes tend to be a little bit more sophisticated than uh, say a classic country tune or a blues. So I'm going to be going from a D6 into a B flat 6, A6, D6. And then from there on, you'll see it's pretty much uh, four and five chords. There's a two five, but you'll see I'm making the same shape for everything. So let's try this in a new context this time. Uh, okay. resist got a little carried away dreaming of warmer weather um all right so how many different places did we do that in let's see or how many different styles did we do that we did over blues we did over country shuffle we did it over rockabilly and hawaiian music um so a lot of different applications of one chord quality this whole time i'm strumming the chord but you could use it 
Uh, when you're soloing at, for call and response, you could use it by, for building lines off of. So let me just show you maybe a different way to kind of arrange it for building lines. So we'll go back to our country shuffle. And this time what I'll do is, instead of always playing it, I'll use it as a template for building a line. So I'm seeing that shape, I'm seeing that scale surround that shape. And I'm really gonna bring attention to this six and five. That's gonna work for Western swing and country. Also, we could throw in that chromatic connection walking down from the six and five. That's gonna be a cool sound too, especially if we change up that articulation. That's gonna make it sound really nice. So let's try this. So templates for building lines works for that too. And then the last thing that I'm going to show you with this is doing call and response. So you could kind of use it as your own personal horn section and throw in little chord stabs in between your lines when you're soloing. So we'll go back to that blues track and do it in that context. So it's really nice for just creating another voice for you to kind of play off of when you're building lines. So a lot of different applications for these things. Um, you know, again, if it's something that you want to kind of take a little further, that course covers all this stuff, all these chord voicings and inversions and voice leading them and embellishing them. And it's 55% off till February 10th. Um, all right, I told you, it's a little moose bouche tiny little lesson here today, but I think it's fun. I think it's useful. And, uh, you know, I want to take an opportunity now to just kind of open it up for questions and say hello. I haven't done this in a long time, so it's nice to be back on here and seeing some folks that I haven't seen in a while. Um, but let me know if you have any questions about what we just talked about. And, you know, I don't care if you have questions about some other stuff, we could, you know, kind of get into that a little bit too. I'm going to peek at the chat. Great on the curve. It's been a while here. It's been a while since I've done these. Um, let's see here. Let me just say some hellos. Oh, Kelly's here. Hey, Kelly. Tony, how's it going? Good to see you, man. Chris. Nice to see you too, bud. Um, cool. All right, need more of this stuff. Well, 
Um, like I said, that course is a good place to grab more. Is is it a satin neck? Uh, no, it's a. I did strip the finish off of the back of this neck, but the uh, it's nitro, um, and I stripped it down just to raw wood because this is my main guitar, and I do play it a ton and. Uh, it was uncomfortable for about a year playing. It was just raw wood back here. But what happens over time, you know, the oils and dirt from your hand just kind of get in there and you end up kind of oiling the, uh, not that I have like super oily hands or anything, but you end up like oiling the back of the neck and now it feels really nice and worn and super smooth. There's no finish on the back, like I said. There is nitro on the front that you could see on the fretboard. It's been wearing down and you could go back and see some of my old instructional videos where this is like bright white and like there's no wear and tear on the neck it's not that long ago um can i use a minor six yeah i would use a minor six but kind of in a different context and you also can't drop this down down a whole step so you, it, you don't get that quick access to a different quality but using minor sixes is great that's a really cool sound to do if I was say playing a minor blues so in that case I'm incorporating a lot of the F sharps so you know, that's really easy to get to by taking that major third there on the G string, that C sharp, lowering that a half step to a C natural. And then when you get what looks like the top of like a D7 bar chord, but you're not thinking of it that way. You're thinking of this as like a minor six chord. That could be a nice little temp template for building lines off of. building rhythmic figures but um, I don't tend to use the minor sixes in the same way uh, that I would those major sixes I mean in the same way that I'm building lines off of them and rhythmic kind of figures off of them but I'm not moving them around down a whole step or grabbing them in sets of threes a lot uh, that's a good question now oh, it came from Jeff of course of course it's a good question uh, let's see what else here. Oh yeah, go ahead and hit that like button right here. And you know, if you want to support what I do, like I know you've heard it a million times from YouTubers and teachers and, um, but subscribing really does help. So that's a great way to kind of help support the channel and help me build this thing here. Another way is also to go to, um, you know, my instructional website, which is called the inspired guitarist.com. Um, there's a link to that in here and um, you know if there's anything there that uh, you're interested in buying courses is a great way to support um, any of your favorite teachers and players uh, what scales would I use over a major six chord um, would that change well yeah generally I would use a major scale but it would definitely change depending on what color I wanted to use so um, if I wanted to, you know, every scale creates a different tonality, right? So if I'm in major, you could think of it as one kind of color or one tone that I'm uh, painting in or speaking in or playing in. And if I lower that seven to a dominant seven and I'm in mixolydian, that's kind of a different color, a different tonality. Um, so it just depends on context, you know? So if I'm playing in a blues, then that same major six chord when we're playing here in C, um, I'm probably not gonna go for major sevens, right? Over a blues, but I would reach up and grab a dominant seven. So if I was thinking of a corresponding scale for that six chord, I would be thinking more of a C mixolydian scale. If we're thinking pentatonics, you know, then you could mix your C major and C minor pentatonic, but... Um, and like I said, building lines off that, I would build lines through those inversions. This is an inversion of a C6. Sorry, 
turns it into a dominant nine. So yeah, I'd be accessing the flat seven quite a bit. If I was playing, um, say like Western Swing, you know, let me get rid of that overdrive there. Um, in that context, I'm not leaning on dominant sevens because it's just not stylistically right. When you're playing over an A6 chord um, or one chord and say like a Western Swing Blues, you're, um, you're really pulling more attention to like root third, fifth, sixth, major sevens, um, right up until the point that that one chord is ready to move into the four chord. That's when you introduce the dominant sound. You don't hang on a dominant sound like you would in say, you know, a Chicago Blues or something. But for something like that, just to set context. There's the first time I introduced that seven for the four chord. Still doing sixes and major sevens. For the five chord, I would do dominant seven and assign a mixolydian scale because it's the five chord, it's naturally dominant. Um, the mixolydian scale goes with that. So yeah, it always, it always depends on context all the time. And I could go from one to the other like I did in that Western Swing. I started with a major scale surrounding that six chord. But when I wanted to go to the four chord, that's when I introduced that mixolydian scale. Honestly though, you know, I, I'm always conscious of what scales uh, are going to move through a chord shape. Um, but I'm more thinking of how every note relates back to the chord. So I, I kind of don't think of scales or think about moving around through scales as much as I do thinking about what every note means against that chord. Uh, let's see if there's some other questions here. Hope that helps. Uh, man, it was really nice to see everybody out. This is this is cool. Like I said, it's been a while. Um, David, you're welcome. I'm glad you're digging the lesson. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions, which is good. That means I explained it perfectly. <laughs> um, cool. Well, if no one has any other questions here, then um, let's keep this, this short, potent little lesson that it is. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll call it. So I hope you dug it. And like I said, if you want to take next steps with this, um, oh, I got a quick one. I will answer this from Jim about the bebop scale, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, how about the bebop scale? I don't think any bebop musician ever plays a bebop scale, thinks about a bebop scale. This is something that like, uh, I, I blame on Berkeley School of Music or publishers try to sell books. Um, nobody before a lot of modal jazz um, thought or considered scales or played in a way where they were um, thinking of scales and scale patterns. That's just not how improvisation worked. It's just really all of our favorite improvisers from, you know, bebop on back are all thinking more about melodic embellishment, embellishing a melody, um, putting a melody through its paces. In other words, establishing a melody and adding compositional devices to grow that melody, or they're embellishing chord tones and chord shapes. That's what almost all improvisation is up until you get to the point of like, you know, late 60s, early 70s, you know, um, jazz. And also it totally corresponds with the, um, the rise of contemporary music schools. Um, so bebop scale. What is the bebop scale? Uh, let's see if I remember because I don't ever think this way or use this stuff because I, I, don't, I don't find it a helpful way to approach music at all. Um, but from what I remember, the bebop scale is basically a major scale, but when you get to the sixth, you chromatically walk up from the sixth into the root, if memory serves me correct. I would 
never think of using that in a consistent way or ripping up and down a scale like that. Never. What I would think of if I was playing over, you know, a C7, I would think of all the chord tones, right? Root, third, fifth, seven. And then I think of all the different ways I could approach them. I could approach them from half step underneath. I could do it from above, right? I can combine those things and do enclosures. Um, I could change the direction of those enclosures. Um, I could chromatically connect any of those notes, like the six and a root. I just go, that's a chromatic connection between a six and a root. I'm not inventing a whole new scale based around a chromatic connection in a major scale or in a uh, mixolydian scale. Um, I think that makes for busy work, and I think that makes for, you know, somebody trying to go, hey, I got this new shiny thing to show you. It's going to change your life. It's called the bebop scale. If you learn it, you'll be able to play bebop. And that's just complete BS. So especially with bebop, where bebop is... You know, bebop is a very culturally important music because this was music that was uh, African-American musicians taking back their music from white musicians, um, claiming ownership of their music again. And, you know, at the forefront, obviously, you have Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker leading that charge. But a big aspect of what bebop was was to not focus on the root third, fifth, seven but to focus all of your lines and improvisation on the extensions of chords. So 7, 9, 11, 13, altering them, connecting them, uh, approaching them from half steps, adding those enclosures, but building a lot of your lines through focusing more on extensions of chords. Um, and that was pretty revolutionary at the time. And it was a hard thing for a lot of like musicians to figure out what was going on. How are these players moving through these changes? Um, so, Absolutely not scale-based. That's why it's even more ridiculous that there's a bebop scale. Okay, with that, <laughs> hope I didn't ruffle any feathers, but oof, scales drive me crazy. Here's, a, here's a, another way to think of scales that will break you of thinking of scales because it is so annoying sometimes. Um, and it's not, I'm not trying to discount like learning scales. Like you should definitely like learn scales. Do you have to learn 200 scales or every little? No. Get the basics, right? Get your major scales, get your, your natural minor, your melodic minor, your harmonic minor. Um, learn the modes of those. Cool. Like, you know, even if you just really know a major scale and the modes of it, you're doing great. But you should be focusing more on arpeggios. So real quick, what I'll leave you with, a different way to think of scales is scales are just an arpeggio with passing notes, right? So here's a C major scale. This is a point of resolve. Third is a point of resolve. Fifth is a point of resolve. Now the root is a point of resolve. Everything else is a tension. So if I'm soloing and making music from a place of tension release, tension release, then I don't really care what the tension is. That tension could represent a half step. It could represent a scale step. It could represent a noise. It could represent kind of anything. I'm playing with tension and release. So resolve note, tension note, resolve note, tension note, resolve note, tension note, tension note, resolve note, right? That's all it is. So whether it's a major scale, whether it's me going through and adding chromatic passing tones, they kind of all serve the same role to a certain extent. Um, I'm a little simplifying a little bit, but I really want people to stop worrying so much about do I know every single scale and focus more on like learning all your arpeggios and your triads and learning how to embellish those things. Way more important. Way more important. All right. Thank you, everyone. This was fun. I'm going to do more. Um, Go check out that website, theinspireguitarist.com. I have lots of live master classes on there. Um, all the old ones that I've done are recorded and they're living up there so you can go check them out. I'm always doing like one or two a month. So if you don't follow me on social media or on my mailing list, then uh, go do that so you could um, stay or, you know, uh, stay informed when the next master class is. 
Uh, I'm building out this new course. It's been a lot of, or new website. It's been a ton of fun. I'm speaking really quick because I've had like three shots of espresso here. Um, it's been a ton of fun. And, uh, but you know, it takes time to build these things. So right now I have some good stuff in there and I'm adding new stuff every month. Right now I have uh, a course on Outlaw Country, um, which is a cool course. I have two sets of jam tracks, one that's just like basically all Will and Jennings jam tracks, another one that's just a bunch of different country styles of jam tracks. Um, and then I have this new course coming out, Imitating Lap Steel Foundations, which for anyone that you know is into these six chords, or playing classic country or western swing, or just loves the videos that I put up where I'm, you know, accessing that sound of lap steel guitar. This is a great way to get started from the basement up. If you don't know anything about it, this starts you at ground zero and gets you to a good point. Um, and that's 55% off to February 10th. All those links in there. Thank you, Jeff McElaine, for helping out today. Uh, Jeff, as you know, I'm sure all you guys know, has his own YouTube channel that's amazing and is always doing lots of lessons and lives and has tons of great courses and also master classes. One of my best buds, fantastic guitar player and great educator, so go follow him. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for showing up. So I'll see you soon. And, um, you know, say hi on the social. <laughs>